of an important speech to Congress on January the 6th, 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt shared his vision for the kind of world that he wanted to see after the war was over. He envisioned for the basic freedoms enjoyed by all people. He said freedom of speech to be enjoyed, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. That would be a wonderful utopian kind of world if that were possible. However, but there's something more that we and I, maybe that he left out there, that you and I can understand even from God's word this morning as we're going to be reading it in just a moment. We, there is another freedom that we need, and that's the freedom is to be free from ourselves and from the tyranny of our own sinful nature. We need to be delivered from that because our sinful nature has a way of um, tripping us up and, and causing all sorts of problems in our lives. And in our reading this morning, we were going to discover that the Holy Spirit gives us the ability in your life and my life to fulfill the law of love that we find. And so if you turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, it is going to be up on your screen, um, but we will be reading that. Galatians chapter 5. All right. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but do, do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Sorry, I went, uh, I went a bit too fast. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do we respect ourselves? Do we take care of ourselves? And what Jesus and what Paul was saying, what Jesus was saying, is that we ought to be taking care of one another in the same manner. But if you're always biting, pardon me, but the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. Beware of biting one another and destroying one another. How oftentimes do we do that? Do we talk about one another? Do we destroy one another's character? It's called character assassination. Do we tear one another down rather than building one another up? Paul had a very practical mind. He was very um, down to earth in, in the way that he looked at it as theology. You remember he was a theologian, a very, very um, intelligent theologian. We can tell that from his writings. But even though he was such a great theologian, he also brought it down to where you and I can understand it in very practical terms on how to live our lives. To him, theology was actually useless unless, unless that theology could actually be lived out in a practical sense. That you and I could actually live the theology that he was talking about. Paul ways always satisfies that test. There was a, this verse is almost like an acid test to you and I on how we conduct our lives. And when his theology, and when theology runs into danger, Paul always looked at it in, a, in, a, in, in such a sense is that how do I make this applicable to the people that we live with? And when Paul declared that the end of the reign of the law had come and that the reign of grace had arrived, some people flipped out and they would actually say, well, that all means that I can do what I like, all the restraints are lifted, and I can follow my own inclinations wherever they would lead me wherever they would lead me. And so people would take that message of Paul and they would twist it and they would make it say something else. Sometimes you and I are prone to go to the extremes. We might go to this extreme where we just conduct our lives in however we would choose, or we may go to the other side of the pendulum and we would conduct our lives in such a legalistic way that there is no freedom at all. What Paul was saying, well, there's, there's, there's got to be another way. And that is the way of grace. And so when we look at the scriptures, we understand that for, for a believer and in this passage, there are two obligations that you and I face and that you and I have to follow as believers. What are those obligations? Number one, it's our obligation to God. We are obliged, when we think of what God has done for our lives and in our lives and what he's in the process of doing our lives. And if God loves us so much, then the love of Christ, the love of God, then would actually constrain us. Think about that for a moment. If God so loved you so much, shouldn't that love constrain us to live a life that is pleasing to Him? But do we? Only you can answer that for yourself. Only you can answer that in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. His thinking is that if I, ca I cannot soil my life 
which was paid for with the most precious life ever lived. Think about that statement. He cannot soil his life because of the precious life that was paid for his life. Think what Jesus gave for you and I this morning. How can we then soil our lives? How can we then live our lives in such a manner in light of what Christ has done for us? Wouldn't be that like us again crucifying the Son of God? Wouldn't we then be part of the crowd that would spit on Him and would be mocking Him if we conduct our lives in such a manner that grieves the Holy Spirit? Christian freedom is not being free, it is being free not to sin. That's what real freedom is all about. Being free not to sin. God gives us that ability. He has the Spirit of God living within us. When you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, or if you haven't as yet, God, Christ will help you to live the life that He calls you to. The second obligation is our obligation to our fellow man. What are we doing with our fellow man? We all rub shoulders with one another. Yes, we have a little sparse this morning because of you know, the, the, the um, retreat and that. But what do we do with one another? What do we do with the people that we rub shoulders with on the commuter trains? What do we do with the people that we work with? What do we do with our neighbors? We are free. But our freedom gives us the ability to love our neighbor as ourselves. Gives us that freedom to love people the way that Jesus loves them. For the believer, a person who is... Uh, the believer is a person who is so conscious of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and His power that he's able then to live and to go and love other people. Without God, the Holy Spirit within us. And that's only, I'm talking to you if you're a Christian this morning. If you are quenching the Holy Spirit or if you're not a believer this morning, it is very difficult for you to love people. When you have God, the Holy Spirit, living within you, if you've given your life to Christ, it becomes a lot more easy. Does it then suddenly become perfect? No. But that's why we listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Paul begins by explaining our calling. We are called to freedom. We, you and I are called to freedom, all of us. And when we understand that grace and freedom go together, you and I have grace and freedom that must live together. We have the grace we've received God's favor in our lives without us deserving it. How then can we not give grace and freedom and offer grace and love to people that we love? How can we not love people if you're a child of God? We sang about that. I'm a child of God. We sang it boldly this morning. We are a ch we children of God and yet we fail to love. Then I question how much do you really love Jesus if you fail to love? And we should be questioning ourselves when we have this anger and animosity or rage against the person. Are we then behaving as a believer? And unfortunately, according to our obligation to God, we are not living the life He calls us to. Christians are free people. You and I are free. We're free from the guilt of sin because we have experienced God's forgiveness. And when we look at one another, we ought to look at one another in the same light. They have re the, this person that I'm looking at, I'm going to use you, Joe, you as an example. God's forgiven Joe as much as he's forgiven me. And if Joe has wronged me, I need to remember that God loves Joe as much as he loves me. And therefore, how can I then not love Joe? Even though he may have wronged me, that love compels me. And that's the grace. He may not deserve the love, but he gets it anyway because of grace. Because of mercy that you and I have received. Believers are free through the power of the Holy Spirit, free from the power of sin in one's daily life. We do not have to be dominated by sin. The Holy Spirit who lives within us, we just need to listen to Him and the prompting of, his, of, of Him in our lives that we can overcome the sin in our lives. And all of us struggle with sin. You, me, and every single person. But we don't have to be a victim of sin. We can be victorious over sin. And as Christians, we are free from the law with all its demands and threats. There's not a certain list of A, B, C, or 1, 2, 3 that we have to follow. It is a law of grace and mercy and freedom. It's a law of love that we follow as believers. Jesus bore the curse of the law, and it ended the tyranny once and for all. For you and I this morning, we are called into freedom because we are called 
by the very grace of Jesus himself. God gave us his grace in Christ. How then can we not offer grace to others? And yet I've met Christians who hate one another, who never speak to one another. Where's grace and mercy, forgiveness and freedom? You see, God's law is here, or God's way is here. My ways are not your ways, God says. We have to elevate ourselves to where God is and not try to bring down and drag God's ways into, to fit into our way of thinking. We have to love as Christ loved. Grace and freedom go together. We must understand it. So we should be the most gracious people who ever walked the face of the earth. The Christian believer no longer has to work or work in order to secure God's approval or acceptance. And neither should our friends and family and so on have to work to gain our approval. It shouldn't be that way. And yet it is. We think here you need to match up to this before I can accept you. And that's wrong, church. We accept them regardless because Christ accepted us regardless. And how then can we not accept one another and love one another as Jesus loves us? Because we've received so much from Him. We are accepted by God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. You and I are accepted of what Jesus, and therefore we can accept one another. Do we have to accept one another's behavior? No, but we can accept one another regardless. And there's a difference there. How, how many times was Jesus wronged with behavior? So much so that they ultimately nailed him to the cross of Calvary. And yet while he was being nailed on there, he said those words, forgive them, Father. Forgive them. As we are being wronged, wouldn't it be cool if we could just say, Lord, forgive them? Maybe in your breath, just under your breath or in your spirit, say, Lord, forgive them. They just don't really realize what they're doing right now. It's walking in grace and walking in the freedom that we've experienced. We as Christians know that we will never be perfect no matter how, good, how much good we do or how wonderful we may think we are in our own estimation. We cannot keep God's laws. We cannot even keep one of those laws perfectly. That's why Christ came. We always fall short of God's holy standards. And if we are ever to be acceptable by God, it has to be because God loves us first and foremost. And it should be enough to provide for us the righteousness. You see, we, our righteousness doesn't cut it. It's only the righteousness of Jesus Christ that makes us acceptable to the Father, who's holy in all His ways. God provided Jesus to be the punishment for us, that you and I, who have violated God's law, can be accepted by God. Only Jesus lived that sinful life and secured the ideal righteousness for God the Father. Only Christ can do that. And Jesus Christ died for each one of us. And in Him dying, He bore the judgment of God's law. He took the judgment upon Himself. And when a person believes the truth about Jesus Christ, that He is truly the Savior, God takes that belief and counts it as righteousness toward us, that we become acceptable to God because of Christ. But again, like I said in the beginning, we don't let that freedom that we have in Christ be a license to live as we please. Remember, our obligation is to God to live a life that is pleasing to Him. Because when we think and consider what He's done for us, how can we then not live for Him? We know that we cannot be acceptable to God because of our own works. And living by the law was always hopeless. It was a hopeless task that left every person lost and helpless. In Galatians, the third chapter, verses 10 through 12, Paul writes these words, But those who depend upon the law to make them right with God are under His curse. For Scripture says, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. And so it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the Scriptures say, It is through faith that a, that a righteous person has life. And the way of faith is very difficult from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. In the 19th verse he says, Why then was the law given? 
It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. The law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. The law is no longer in effect. We are free in Christ. There's two things that I want you to note this morning. There are two very important things, and you can write these down on your pieces of paper that are in your notes. Um, number one, there's the danger of license, and I've kind of just touched on that. Can a person who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord of their life still live a life of worldliness? Before you answer, before you say, can a person who's accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives, can they still live a life of worldliness? Worldliness is just going and doing as you please. Of course not. But is it possible? Yes. But we shouldn't, because then we've missed our obligation to the Lord and our obligation to our fellow man. And so we cannot just go as we want. I suppose if we were to say, you can live that way and still call yourself a Christian, but don't expect a reward from the Lord. And if you continue in that way, because when, when the Scriptures talk about sin and that we continue in sin, then we are again crucifying the Lord again, according to Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. So we don't go that way. We live a life that is pleasing to God. And when we do mess up, we quickly come, because the Spirit of God is right there, and He lays on our heart, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, it's not an accusation, it's the guilt, I guess, of sin. And we, we feel bad about him. So what do we do? We confess it to the Lord Jesus Christ and we again receive his forgiveness. The person who declares such an idea fails to understand what true belief is. If we just live our lives of worldliness, we really don't understand what faith is all about. We don't really understand what having a relationship with God is all about. The Bible, as we read in the scriptures about belief, it doesn't just mean an intellectual belief, but it means to believe something more than just in the mind. True belief in the Scriptures means a committed belief. It means to believe something with one's entire life. In other words, your mind is connected to God. Your body is connected to God. Didn't Paul say that we ought to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service? Is what we should be doing as believers? To believe in Christ is to commit one's life to Christ. And if we think about it logically, if a person is not willing to commit their life to Jesus Christ, they don't really believe in Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. If we fail to really be committed, then we are actually saying, I don't really believe what the Scriptures teach about Jesus. I really don't believe in Christ. If we fail to connect and live our lives in such a manner. And if we really believed we would unquestionably give all that we are and have to the cause of the cross, to the cause of Jesus Christ. That's what a real believer is all about, is that we are totally committed to Christ. In Romans, the sixth chapter, Paul wrote to, wrote to the believers in Rome, and he said, don't you realize that you become a slave whatever you choose to obey? You can, you, you can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. That's the choice. There wasn't anything in between there. We can be a slave to sin or we can be a slave to righteous living. We can serve God. Not in a sense of slavery, but in a sense of, of, of just desiring to walk with God. That's what a believer is like. And the second thing that we talk about is the restraint of love. So we have the restraint of, of, of the Spirit of God. We have the restraint here of, God, of love. The true believer is free from having to secure God's approval through any other means but through Jesus Christ. If we try to try get God's approval, we just read the passage, we will never gain it through keeping the law because it was impossible. And the one restraint placed on every believer is love. Is love. Here, love. Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus would say. God loves you and I so much that when a person sees and experiences the love of God, we are drawn to His love, and therefore we begin to love as well. We not only do we experience God's love, 
a love that you could never ever fully describe. But when we've experienced that in a real personal way, then you cannot but help have love pour out of you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, Paul wrote to the believers in Corinth and he said, Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we, all, that we have all died to our old life. The question is, have we? If we love Christ so much, have we put the old man to death? Have we put the old person to death? He died for everyone so that those who receive this new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. We will live for Christ and we will live for Him. For Him, for God to, to please Him. Christian freedom is not a license to sin, but an opportunity to serve. Isn't that great? Do we serve God first and foremost, and then one another, to love one another in such a manner as Christ calls us to? Paul says that we should use our freedom to serve one another in love. There's a simple formula that we can look at this morning. It's very simple. You can jot this down. I think I may have even put it in your notes. Freedom plus love equals service to others. If we've received our freedom and we've got our love and we put that together, we want to serve one another. However, if we have freedom minus love, then we have a license and then we become a slave to sin. You cannot experience God's freedom without God's love. We have to have the both. We have to have both. We cannot be free and choose not to love. We can't be born again and say we love Jesus, but we fail to love. It doesn't work. It, it doesn't fit into God's scriptures. The amazing thing about God's love is that it takes place, takes the place of all of the laws that God ever gave. Isn't that amazing? Love connects all of His laws and takes the place. In Romans 13, verses 6 to 11, it says, Owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. Owe no man anything except to love them. How cool is that? I owe you nothing except all I owe you is to love you. Like Jesus loves me. Think how much Jesus loves you. For the commandment says you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirements of God's law. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I'll kind of look at that. The second coming of Jesus is nearer now than the day that I believed, back in 19, I think, 75 it was. I have to love. We have to love. Love is Jesus' love. You see, if you love people because you love Christ, you won't want to steal from them. You won't want to lie about them. You won't envy them. You won't try in any way to hurt them if we love that person. You know, when we find in God's Word, when we find in, in, in the book of Corinthians, there's a wonderful passage in, in the 13th chapter that's called the love passage. But go back and reread it. Is that the kind of love that I have? Love in our heart is God's substitute for His laws and the threats or the repercussions of breaking a law. On a much higher level, the Holy Spirit within us gives us the love that you and I need. We have God Himself indwelling us. He gives us that ability. In the fifth chapter of Romans, in the fifth verse, He says, And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. The Holy Spirit is in our heart. He has given us His love. We can't love without His presence in our lives. He indwells us and therefore because we have Him in our lives, we can love one another as He wants us to do. It was apparent that the Galatian believers were lacking in this kind of love. That's why Paul addressed it. Paul 
adds a very grim bit of advice here. And this is the kind of negative part of it. And he says, that unless you solve the problem of living together, you will make life impossible. I can say that in marriages. Unless you solve the problem of living together, life is impossible. People want to split. You ought to love one another as husband and wife. You ought to love one another as a body. Why do churches break up? Why do people split? It's because they're not walking in love. That's the bottom line. If we really loved, little things wouldn't irritate us so much. If we really loved as Jesus loved us. Selfishness does not exalt a person. It destroys a person. In verse 25 of Galatians chapter 5 it says, But if you, you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. We're always biting and devouring. He's saying this to a church. The churches of Asia Minor in Galatia. Paul was saying, you are guys are biting one another. The picture that Paul points out here is of wild animals literally attacking one another. <laughs> I'll put this up there. How many teeth marks... How many teeth marks do we carry on our bodies from other believers? And how many teeth marks have we left on others? I think there's a typo on that slide, but it's too late to fix it this morning. How many teeth marks? Look on your arms. Look, look, look at your life spiritually. How many tooth marks are there from other believers? That, that literally bit you. And then think about how many teeth marks did you leave on others? That's the picture that Paul gives us. I remember as a kid growing up, I don't remember actually, but I, my, my brother told me and so did my mom and dad when they were alive, that I had this huge fight with my cousin. Now, now we're great friends now, but I was just, I was playing in the sandbox apparently and she came and took one of my toys. I got so mad I grabbed her leg and I literally chomped on the leg. I mean, I was, I mean, I was, she was bigger than me. <laughs> Did I get it after that? Oh, you better believe. Because she yelled out this blood-curdling cry, apparently. Everyone came running, and I got the walloping of my life. Did I ever bite again? Never. I learned the lesson. But I left a mark. She carries that mark to this day. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but children do that as a defense or because of anger and the only thing they can do is lash out and that's the picture that Paul gives us here is that we bite one another literally this viciousness that goes on that proves that people cannot be forced to get along together you can't force people to get along with each other through the law or through anything other than God the Holy Spirit we can clearly see that in our society today that is filled with gazillions of laws that people still cannot get on with one another in spite of how many laws we have. Because we do not have God in our hearts. I'm not saying you, I'm saying just in general. No matter how many rules and standards a church may apply or adopt as a guarantees, there's no guarantee for any kind of spirituality. No matter what we say, these are the rules that we ought to live by. That's why when you ask, well, what are the rules here? The rule is to love Jesus and your fellow man. That's the rule. And if we can live our lives in that manner, the other stuff kind of falls in place. Unless the Holy Spirit is permitted to fill our hearts with His love, selfishness and competition will reign. Think about those words for a minute. It's even prevalent in the body of Christ. We cannot love one another without being in Christ. That's the only way. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to grow in love for God and for our neighbor. It is only through the Holy Spirit living within us. The two extremes in the Galatian churches were the legalists and the libertines who were actually destroying the fellowship. The two extremes were ripping the fellowship apart. But the Holy Spirit doesn't work in a vacuum. He uses the Word of God. He uses prayer. He uses worship. He uses fellowship. To build up the body of Christ. To strengthen one another. So when we come together in worship, we worship the Lord, bringing our hearts together. When we, in, in prayer, we pray for one another. As we in God's Word and we read a scripture, we, we pray God's Word. Like Bob mentioned this morning when he opened up with the scriptures. And as Sharice opens up in the scriptures. 
we build one another up and we strengthen one another. The believer who is led by the Holy Spirit spends time in prayer, in the Word of God, and enjoys genuine freedom that will help strengthen not only their own personal life, but will strengthen the body of Christ as well, being His church. Paul clearly describes this contrast in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, where he compares spiritual maturity and the ministry of grace to the carnal ministry of the law. Go back and read it for yourself. I'm not going to go through that this morning. Our spirit, spiritual freedom that you and I have is the opportunity to do what Christ wants us to do without fear that our performance is counted against us. You see, we're not graded on our performance, on how well we do. We grade it on how much we love Jesus and how much we love one another. We are free from the endless arguments and the endless ceremonial laws of sin and fear. We are not autonomous from Christ. We are under the restraint of God the Holy Spirit and the constraint of the higher law, and that is the law of love. It is the law that you and I must always live our lives by. The freedom that we have is to live according to God's standards and be used to glorify Christ as lovingly as we serve one another. And the Greek word there, when we've heard this so many times, is agape and it refers to the selfish, the selfless, the giving love, as we read in 1 Corinthians 13. Go back and read it for yourself. My hope and my prayer for you and I this morning is that us as believers that we will serve and love God with every bit of energy that we have, that we will fall deeply in love with God again, deeply in love when we consider what Jesus has given to us, and then that we ought to love one another and serve one another with the love of God that is placed in your heart and my heart by the Holy Spirit. Let us walk in love, church, loving God, that when people bump us, or mock us, or ridicule us, what spills out of us is love. I have to confess, it's not always love that spills out. It's a reaction and it's anger. And God's working on me. I'm still a work in progress, as you are as well. And I can be bold in saying that because we haven't arrived. But we're on a journey, and it's a marvelous journey as we spoke about last week. Let's close and pray.